everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm Casey Bryant, and this is the Hat City Hockey Show. Toddler crawling our way to 2020's finish line like a dehydrated marathon runner. Ordinarily, we focus on Danbury hockey and things happening around the NHL, but unfortunately today we have a bit of somber news to share, so, so just mentally prepare yourself. Some of you may have been familiar with Danbury's Mayor Mark Boughton, aka Mayor Marky Mark, who became sort of a national celebrity through the renaming of the John Oliver Memorial Sewer Plant during our saga with HBO's Last Week Tonight. Well, we have received some rather unfortunate news that Mayor Marky Mark is no longer with us. You know, he was here for a very long time, but sadly, he's moved on. I'm of course referring to his new position in Governor Lamont's office as the Commissioner of the Department of Revenue Services. I know, Danbury is losing its mayor. It's a crushing blow. So I've taken the liberty of arranging a video tribute to Mayor Marky Mark's greatest accomplishments while in the mayoral office. Enjoy. I will I didn't really follow his career very closely. Anyway, good luck, Commissioner Marky Mark. And who knows, if our season is delayed anymore, maybe I'll take a stab at running City Hall a while. Start a few more viral feuds. How hard can it be? And I'll keep your resume on file in case any internship opportunities arise. You know, in case your whole gig as tax man doesn't really pan out. Before we get going with our first guest, our featured charity of the week is Toys for Tots. With the pandemic going on, toy donations are going to take a big hit this year, so head to toysfortots.org, find your local campaign, and see how you can help kids in your neighborhood have a great holiday season. We've got a great show here, the legendary Howie Rose is coming up in a bit, but first, I had the chance to sit down with one of Danbury's fan favorites. Take a look. My first guest on the Hat City Hockey Show just re-signed for his second season with the Danbury Hattricks. He's a fan favorite known as Scory, number 27, Corey Anderson. Corey. I was going to ask you, your boy, uh, John Oliver, ever uh, personally reach out to you yet or no? <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, he hasn't ever. His producers have a couple of times. I was loving it, man. I was eating it all up, uh, man. Just from start to finish, it was like a little mini movie. Just kind of like waiting for it to build all the way up to the sewer plant. And finally it happened. And it was a slow ending. build, wasn't it? It was, it was no, a really it was awesome. good climax. <laughs> yeah, unreal. The yeah. first thing I always ask Corey to everyone who comes on here is what is it that's kept them sane through everything, what they've been watching, reading, listening to, that's kind of kept them going through this whole quarantine. I uh, was crushing Ozark. I watched um, the Umbrella Academy, I had a season out. Um, just got into this new show called Altered Carbon, pretty like sci-fi show, kind of keeps you interested. Luckily, uh, golf courses have been open, so I've been playing a lot of golf actually shot an 81 for the first time so i mean you know maybe amateur status uh coming up here deal. in the future <laughs> yeah we have uh, the holidays coming up here honk is going on right now christmas is coming up in a week uh do, are there any holiday traditions in the anderson household that you're getting ready for yeah we typically do uh my dad's side on christmas eve everyone we just get in our like our pjs comfy clothes whatever and we just hang out at my aunt my aunt's house and um it's it's you know something i always look forward to every year um like i i took off home at 16 years old and i actually uh every christmas have been able to come back home for that time of the year so it's always something that i personally always look forward to you know spending that time with my family and then uh christmas day we keep it very simple on my mom's side you know have breakfast and our morning coffees and hang out and you know, buy the tree and stuff like that and open our gifts. So it's very simple, but it's a lot of fun though at the same time. Is there a staple meal that you usually have at breakfast or dinner? Nana always loves to make her eggs and bacon. That's kind of like just the go-to. I don't know why, but she's like, yeah, you know, eggs, bacon, sourdough toast. And I was like, all right, <laughs> let's just sit. Classic. That's the old standby. That, and you yeah. can't fail there. Now you mentioned you, uh, you left home at 16. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to touch on was the fact that you did uh, go abroad to uh, Notre Dame out in Canada, uh, where you played prep school out there, which Notre Dame for the uninitiated is a very uh, prestigious uh, hockey 
hockey school. A lot of legends have come out of there. Barry Trotz came out of there. John Cooper, Rod Brindamore, a lot of people came through there. What was yeah. your experience like? Yeah, so my experience with it, um, so when I was 15 years old, um, I played in Bakersfield, got um, the Western States Hockey League, the Tier 3 Junior League. It came for, to town for the first time, so I was lucky enough to play on that team at that level at 15 years old. And then one of my coaches um, knows um, a scout for the Moose Jaw Warriors of the WHL very well. And um, he came out and, you know, watched a couple games and scouted me and stuff like that. Like, hey, we'd love to invite you to our camp um, up in Moose Jaw, stuff like that. So, and, you know, it was a whole different world for me. You know, being, well, one, California hockey, like especially me growing up, like wasn't that popular. Um, so to see where it's come now from when I was a kid is awesome. So I get there, uh, camp goes really well, you know, make it to the final day, stuff like that. Uh, I'm in this in the room with uh, the coaches and all the scouts and uh, everything like that. And I got my dad with me, you know, I'm 15 years old, like kid, just like 16 years old, you know, not really knowing how the whole junior hockey process works and stuff like that yet. And so we're chatting, they're like, hey, you know, Corey, like, you know, you know, you got all the potential in the world for, you know, to be on our team and stuff like that. But, you know, it's just you're not ready for our team yet. And so they're like, hey, what are you going to do? So I said, OK, I'll probably just go back home to California, try to make some midget AAA team, whatever, and uh, see where it goes. And then my dad just pipes up and he goes, oh, I think we're going to go Notre Dame. <laughs> and like, I just like in my head, I, like, I kind of looked and I looked at him in my head. I'm just like, who oh, are we now? <laughs> So, but, but I mean, you know what, like, like, I'll tell you what, though, um, going to Notre Dame, though, was probably the best decision um, I ever made. Just the school itself and the environment that you're in for one, you're in the middle of nowhere um, with 200 people that live there and then the school, like, that's it. And so there's no, the closest city is like 30 minutes away. So there's no shot of you going anywhere. The whole idea of Notre Dame, you know, helping you grow into a better man or a better woman and um you know just a better person in general in life yeah like you said a bunch of big names have come out of there um morgan riley as well who played yeah. uh who plays for toronto uh hayden flurry who plays for carolina was my teammate for a year in midget um so a lot of big names have definitely come out of that school but overall best experience of my life for sure do you and billy mccreary who's a, a shattuck st mary guy do you ever just kick back and like compare how prestigious your prep school experience was i'm sure i'm probably sure over at shattuck they probably had it a lot nicer so you probably got all the, the nice little treatments and stuff like that where us it was more of a little blue collar town kind of you know so you're saying he was style, panther. A lot more you're, you're saying he was coddled when he was there from your time at notre dame you were able to uh, parlay that into a uh, tenure at manhattanville when you're there which another uh prestigious trip there because you bring a uchc title there you you get to go to the ncaa tournament first time in 12 years for the valiant seems like success is following you everywhere you go uh yeah. what's, the, what's the valiant experience like I, I, yeah i don't know the valley experience i was an awesome one in itself you know it was a pretty kind of easy decision to decide manhattanville like going from small town saskatchewan to big city new york was a uh, you know, kind of something I was kind of looking forward to. You know, graduating with 13 guys, that's that's pretty something in its spe uh, special in itself as well. And so um, for us to bring home that UCHC title was, um, you know, a piece of history that I'm very proud of. I want to share my screen with you here so you can see what I see. Uh, there's the uh, the championship photo right there. There's you right there, oh, dead center, yeah. holding the banner. There's Casper, <laughs> who seems to be having a pretty good time of himself. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. It must be such a relief, no, that, that final moment. What's going on in this photo? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. We are just absolutely screaming our heads off. You know, that – for anyone who plays college hockey or, you know, AHL, whatever, that gets to experience, you know, that Utica rink, they are basically Section 102 in an arena. They <laughs> will absolutely feed you con comments all the time like just trying to like get you mentally checked out. Um, so for us, and we had never beaten, if I, history serves me right, we, my four years, we had never beaten Utica yet. And so um, for us to win it in their barn, you know, in front of all of all those fans and everything like that was just like the most utter, unreal experience. Like you're, 
I don't know what you call it, your underdog story, whatever, because like people weren't expecting us to win, but you know, come championship day, it's a whole different world, right? So that feeling of accomplishing that is just something that all of us took, you know, a lot of pride in for sure. And so, yeah, that, that picture definitely just says it all of us just screaming our heads off and that bus ride though back was awesome as well. So, yeah. I see a lot of uh, backward turns fans making their way to the uh, to the exits there. That's got to be great to silence. A, a exactly too. Yeah. That, just, that just shows you like, oh, like they were just so disappointed and you know. But hey, gotta do yeah. what you gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of the smiley one on the team. You're one of the most photogenic guys on the team. Uh, so for for a positive message here for our fans, is there anything that you'd like to say to all of the hat tricks faithful that are eagerly waiting the opportunity to cheer you on again? First off, for this past season, thank you guys so much for playing a big part in getting our first season as a hat tricks organization. You know, hitting the floor running, but just like being honestly the best fans in the league. You know, nothing got us more excited than you know playing in front of all you guys. You know, seeing that whole stands filled with fans and cheering you on is just such a big energy that you feed off of as a player you know that that whole place is filled you know from standing room to up in the top bleachers area stuff like that um and you know connecting with you guys too on a personal level you know i love when we come off to into the lobby after home games and stuff like that and get a chat with you guys and you know get your thoughts on you know what you saw and stuff like that so definitely the best fans in the league and we're itching every single day you know we're talking in our group chat you know just itching at the bit to uh get back to uh, the hat city and start playing for you guys again such a pleasure to talk to you man thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate it thanks for having me casey appreciate it The Hat City Hockey Show is presented by the Danbury Hat Tricks. Follow at Danbury Hat Tricks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and subscribe to youtube.com slash Danbury Hat Tricks. My next guest on the Hat City Hockey Show is a broadcasting legend and a New York sports icon. You name it, he's done it. From radio for the New York Rangers to TV for the New York Islanders to currently being the radio voice of the New York Mets, please welcome Howie Rose. Howie. The first thing I always like to ask all of my guests, Howie, is what they've been doing to keep sane through all of this process, what they've been watching, reading, listening to that has kind of kept them in the right mindset. You know, I read a lot of books. Um, I love an author by the name of Ronald Balson who writes a lot of historical fiction. I really enjoy that. Um, I took to Twitter back in April and I've been having some fun with that, more so than I ever thought I would really because just staying engaged with the fans, you know, and, and specifically the fans of the Mets and our listening audience is, has really been energizing for me and has helped get through the pandemic. So uh, a lot of that, not as much TV as, as maybe I, I used to, but uh, in any event, um, I'm ready for things to get back to normal, but it's going to be a while yet. I tell you, you picked the right time to join Mets Twitter because it's gone from being a very negative cesspool to all of a sudden everything is bright and bouncy. We're, we're having a beautiful day. It's great. <laughs> it's true. And, you know, I, I felt badly for those who run social media for the Mets because it didn't matter what they did. You know, things had gotten so unfortunately hostile between and really just on the part of the fans towards the prior ownership who just you know they just couldn't sustain it any longer but i I felt bad for the for the for the social media people because they put out content and invariably you check the responses and they were all the same sell the team and some a lot more vitriolic than that so this has been kind of refreshing and energizing. We'll see where it goes. I tell you, one of the ways that uh, me and my family have been keeping sane has been uh, playing a lot of Stratomatic baseball. Uh, I'm sitting next to a giant stack of cards from all of like the 20 different seasons plus the Hall of Fame set that we have here. Would you agree with me that Stratomatic is one of the underrated modes of entertainment? Underrated only by those who don't know it or understand it. For me, it was a huge part of my, I guess, adolescent years. I started playing it when I was about 12. They didn't make the computer baseball game compatible with it, with Max, and that's pretty much when I stopped playing it. But I mean, Keith Hernandez would play seasons on the planes as we traveled on the team charters from city to city. He might still be playing it for all I know. The 71 Braves really let me down in in the season that we're playing here because they got off to a really hot start. They won their first six, then lost their last six in the last game. It's a very hot and cold team. Not a lot of pitching beyond Necro. uh, And that's kind of shot me in the foot in my season. It happens. 
Fire yeah. the manager. <laughs> Speaking of that new ownership for New York Mets, one of the things that Steve Cohen has said that he's going to bring back for the New York Mets is Old Timers Day, which uh, certainly makes me excited to see the players from my youth, but especially because hosting those events seems to be right in your wheelhouse. I've been- Let me back you up a second before you go any further. In your youth, you mean back in your youth? How old are you now? You look about <laughs> tops. I'm, I'm 25. I know I don't. Okay, so we need to go how far back to satisfy the. Well, you know, you could get like you could get Tioshi Shinjo walking back uh, in. You could be getting yeah. Jeremy Burnitz walking back in. I don't know. You can get some. Right. Okay, no, I find I'm really excited about that. Uh, logistically, I don't know that they can make that happen for obvious reasons in 2021, but hopefully by 2022 they can go full bore with that. And you know me as a as a Mets traditionalist and, you know, kind of part-time historian, if you will, I'm all for that. What does it mean to, to MC those kinds of events? Because I've been at the, uh, the 69 anniversary that you did recently, the uh, Piazza's number retirement, the last game at Shea, you've been at the center of all that. And it's your passion that really bleeds. Yeah. When, when one of those events comes up, what does it mean to you when you, when you know you've got that to circle on the calendar? Everything. It is so, surreal and I'll give you an example especially from I guess it was the 40th anniversary of the 69 team I was 15 in 1969 so those were my guys I mean to win a championship or have your team win a championship at that age is perfect because you can devote yourself completely on an emotional level to that team you know you get a little bit older and your priorities change a little bit, but to be 15 and, and to have your team win, especially under unexpected circumstances like that, well, that lasts forever. So those guys were my heroes, really. And, you know, some of them have actually become friends over the years, which is kind of cool too. But I'll never forget, the podium was out, I guess in short center field or something, and, and, and the players were lined up to my left and my right. And it was time to turn around, face the flag, and they were going to play the national anthem. And back in those days, in 1969, the players would take the field and stand at attention at their positions for the anthem. Now, you know, the networks, they, they do what we call cover the anthem, meaning play commercial time over the national anthem, and they play it before the players take the field. It's a lot different now. But when we played the anthem, I'm standing out there looking at the flag, and then I peek to my left, and there's Tom Seaver and Buddy Harrelson in uniform, you know? And I turn to my right, and there's Jerry Kuzman and Ron Swoboda. And I'm thinking, it's like an out-of-body experience. I mean, it's as though I were, you know, one of them playing as a contemporary because that's the way it used to look. They'd be standing out there with their caps to their chest, and that was wild. The other experience I had that will probably surprise you a little bit, was when we did the 2006 20 year anniversary of the 86 Mets. Sure. That was the first time that they placed the podium right at second base. And unfortunately it was kind of a rainy night so they had the tarp on the field, but the, the podium was at second base. Now I'm a huge, huge Beatles fan. And that's where the stage was when the Beatles played at Shea Stadium. And even though I'm introducing all of these, by that time, the 86 team, friends and, you know, people who were great players in a lot of cases, and you would think I'd be getting a charge from that, all I could think of the entire time I was doing that ceremony was, this is exactly where the Beatles were standing. And I had all I could do not to break into Babies in Black or I'm Down or something like that, which wouldn't have gone too well. but. Those two are the ones that I really remember the most, the treasure the most. Similar to the Beatles, you play six of the hits and then you're out, because there was a short concert at Shea Stadium. <laughs> so yeah, like, oh. not that anybody could have heard it anyway who was there above the screen. <laughs> I tell you, it's, it's the apparent fandom and, and the cognizance of the fan base that really gets people's attention. I, I go back, one of my favorite shows when it was on was Beat the Booth. I loved that show. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would watch it with my dad and my brother and my mom. Uh, you're getting guys like in that uh, Shea trivia show where you have to guess the player. You're getting guys like Joe Foy and getting them quickly. Joe Foy had yeah. a year as a Met, and you're still like, oh, yeah, him. Absolutely. Who doesn't know Joe Foy? Come well, on. the thing is, the advantage we had is when things got tense towards the end, 
we were used, Gary and I, we're, we're comfortable around the cameras and the lights and all that. That's true. And we can think on our feet because we're trained to do that. The others were not. And you got a lot of deer in the headlights look. I'm on uh, paid for the Mets and Yankees left-handed reliever. A lot of games. Oh, Luciano. Oh. Come on, we got it. I can't breathe. But I will tell you a little secret about that. If we didn't win, we might have lost Gary Cohen because he was very, very nervous. He thought if we didn't win, if we let a couple of fans basically walk in off the street and beat us at Mets Trivia, he would basically feel as though we were completely fraudulent, delegitimized, <laughs> and exposed. And so he was really, really nervous about it. I said, come on, man, we're just going to have some fun. So I think hopefully we were able to loosen Gary up and we got through it fine. I could pick your brain about the Mets all day because uh, that's my team. But uh, this is the channel of a hockey team. So I should ask you at least a little bit about your days in hockey because yeah. you've called the Rangers for years. You called the Islanders the, for years before stepping away in 2016. Uh, <laughs> other than February trips to Winnipeg, is there anything <laughs> you miss about your, uh, your days in hockey? Just being in the booth and doing the games. People have asked me forever which sport did you enjoy broadcasting more? And I would tell them, and I know it sounds like a cop-out, but it's not, is that they're equal passions. Because they're, you couldn't find two more disparate games to call because of the speed of hockey and the more languid pace of baseball. It's really having the best of both worlds. And so I miss everything other, of course, than travel about doing hockey. They had really made it increasingly difficult for broadcasters because all these new buildings, or most of these new buildings, put the facilities where we work from, the booths, way up, and worse yet, way back. And it became very difficult, really, to, to follow the game the way we used to when we were seated a lot closer to the action. And unfortunately, I felt a lot of my time on the air and doing hockey on TV over the last few years was just straining to see who was who. When we were talking to Brendan Burke, that kind of became a, uh, an overarching theme because we were talking about the better views in the booth. And, you know, Peter Marr once wrote that he loved the, the, the Montreal Forum, which was right old. Oh, uh, yeah, perfect. All the old buildings, yeah. Uh, Brendan really liked the uh, the viewpoint from both the Barclays and the Nassau Coliseum because it was low to the ice and within yes. the crowd. You're kind of right. immersed in that feeling with the, everyone cheering right around you. Right. By virtue of the Barclays Center not having a press box. Well, not only that, I don't I don't think they have heat in that building. That that's the worst building I've ever done a game in Barclays Center. Really, it was just so cold and uncomfortable. The Islander fans didn't want to be in Brooklyn. I didn't want to be in Brooklyn. It's not where the Islanders belong. Um, you know, selfishly, I had a short commute from where I lived on Long Island to the Coliseum, and Brooklyn was all different. It, it just, it never really felt like it had a chance to work. But from what I understand, the Belmont Arena is going to be fabulous because I think they're going to have a gondola. The people who redid Madison Square Garden are a lot of the same people who are involved in building Belmont. I gotta tell you, I wish I could have done all my games for the Rangers in the location they have now, um, up on that catwalk at Madison Square Garden. They call it the bridge, and it is perfect. It is just a fabulous way to do a hockey game. And I, I could do triple headers doing games from that location at Madison Square Garden. I wish that I would have, would have had the chance to do more games there. It is a perfect view. I've been up there in the Chase Bridge. I mean, that is just a, it's magnificent up there to watch a hockey game. Really love that area. Uh, I will say uh, our booth in Danbury, because I do play by play for our hockey teams and our booth is just a little cut out in the back row of our uh, fan base. And we have very rambunctious fans in Danbury, uh, kind of infamously so. We have one guy who just has a fire truck horn right by the opposing bench. So every now and then you just hear, it's called Hell's Horn. In the, after a goal. Steven swings and miss. Levesque drags him down to the ice. And a roar of approval from the Danbury Hattricks faithful as Nicola Levesque gets a fight victory. 
Uh, and we have a gong man. We have a guy who just stands there with a gong. Carrick, a bit of a new look first line as a redirection and they score! Nikola Lebeck! The Hattricks lead it one to nothing! Minor league sports, they're a beautiful thing. Yeah, but it's fun. Yeah. If you ever do a game in Columbus, beware of that cannon. Yeah. <laughs> yup. Off. I had no idea that was coming. The first time we did a game in Columbus, I guess I must have been working with Joe Micheletti then. Uh, when Columbus came into the league, I just about jumped into his arms when they blew that thing off. <laughs> um, I didn't know they were going to fire off a cannon, but they did, and um, it was different. <laughs> but it's, you know, that's, that's particular to, to the Columbus Blue Jackets, and I think it's great. As far as the Islanders' recent memories go, you weren't in the booth for this particular game, but I have to ask you, as someone who covered the team for so long, was the homecoming for John Tavares the most ruthless homecoming you've ever seen? I was, I, I, I kind of felt for him because JT's a great kid. He really is. And I think that whether he didn't do a good enough job of explaining to the fans what his mindset was or, you know, whether it's just the way you kind of would have expected that, that it would have gone. Um, I think in his heart of hearts, he was truly torn between staying with the Islanders and going to Toronto. I think he was less than excited at, at first about being in the fishbowl. You know, playing in Toronto is akin to, you know, playing for the Yankees or the Mets or you know, just being in what New York is, is in terms of media attention. And I'm not sure John was going to embrace that, but in the end he did. It was his childhood team. I get it, believe me. But I, I just felt sad that he has been vilified the way that he's, he's been. But I understand that. I get it. Something else that the Islander fans are very passionate about uh, are their jersey designs. You've been very vocal about your opinions on the black <laughs> Mets jerseys. But what do you think about the Fisherman Islander jerseys? Should they make a comeback like the fans will? Uh, here's the thing. Um, I have very complicated memories of that Fisherman jersey because the year they brought those out was my first year. Remember now, I'm coming from the Rangers who had won the Stanley Cup about 14 months before I was hired by the Islanders. And Jiggs, of course, was beloved by the Islander fan base. With my Ranger background, I was anything but. So when you consider the confluence of these events, my arrival, unpopularly to be sure, the fisherman jersey coming at the expense of the crest and the tradition that was emblematic of one of the greatest teams in the history of the National Hockey League, and the fact that the Islanders were a bad team my first year, 95-96, that was just a bad way to start. So when I think of that fisherman's jersey, yeah, I don't have a lot of warm and fuzzy things to say about it, but all these years later, it almost seems as though, from what I read anyway, that the fans have embraced the gimmickry of it and would welcome it back on a specific night or two. And so in concert with that, if the Mets are going to bring the black jerseys back, say, on Friday nights, once a month or twice a month, as Mike Piazza suggested, go ahead, knock yourselves out, as long as it's not the main jersey you know and i think islander fans would say the same thing they've got an iconic jersey the islanders do and it's funny how you look at most sports when they do something a little goofy and off the rails when they leave their traditional jersey to try a different design or a different color a lot of the gratuitous black jerseys being a perfect example um Look at how many of them ultimately return to their traditional roots. And the Islanders were a perfect example of that. So are the Mets. So those are the jerseys that I relate to. And those are the ones that should be the main ones forever. Embracing the gimmickry seems to be the theme for a lot of the reverse retro jerseys. Did you see the Anaheim Mighty Ducks one with Wild Wing bursting through the ice? Yeah. I, you know, that, that was to me the low point in NHL jersey history around the <laughs> mid the mid to the latter part of the 1990s, when everybody just went as outlandish as, as they could in designing these jerseys. I mean, the St. Louis Blues with the, the trumpet yep. and some of the weird color schemes and patterns. 
Um, they the just Flyers almost had Teal for a second. The Flyers almost had what? The Flyers almost had Teal in their jerseys. That I didn't know. Yeah, that was that no, was a projected pitch. It came very close to fruition, but the Flyers almost had Teal in their color. No, the city of the Broad Street Bullies were not going to accept that. <laughs> never would have, never would have happened. I understand why they probably rejected it, um, but it's been great for the Sharks. I mean, that's the Sharks are teal. Yeah. It's like I wish the Marlins here in Florida would go back to teal. That's what they wore when they started the franchise, and I thought it was a great look for them. I will say the the one reverse retro where it's like the '90s logo that I really like is the Return of the Statue of Liberty. That I, I do. Did you? I don't like that one. No? I like the, um, I, believe it or not, and some Ranger fans think this is blasphemous, but the Fergie jerseys have really grown on me as alternates over the years. Now, they wore them for two years, and I was absolutely appalled at the fact that they took one of the classic jerseys in all of sports, and they basically threw it in the garbage and came up with the John Ferguson era, which only lasted two years, design. But... When I look at it now, all these years later, you got the crest on the front of the jersey. The color scheme was fine. I'd have tweaked the shoulders a little bit, maybe not made the piping run all the way down the arms. But as a third jersey, I like that better than the Statue of Liberty jersey. I really do. You mentioned Jigs McDonald, and it reminds me of uh, an interview that you gave a little while ago where you once joked that one of the biggest challenges in your career was following in the footsteps of, of great broadcasters, you know, be it Marv Albert for the Rangers or, or Jigs for the Islanders or Bob Murphy for the Mets. Right. Now, we spoke to one of your followers uh, in Brendan Burke a couple of weeks ago. Be it in the Islanders booth or down the line when you've called the five Pete for the New York Mets in 2025, uh, what would you want your legacy to be when someone follows a Howie Rose? Well, I don't know, but let them worry about it if the Mets win five in a row. You know? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, I just want one, you know. Just That's what keeps me going at this point. I want to make that call on radio when the Mets win the World Series. And uh, I'm willing to wait as long as that takes, but hopefully it's going to be a, a short-term endeavor. I don't really believe in being anything other than yourself on the air, you know? So my only agenda in following any of those great Hall of Fame broadcasters you just mentioned was to honor their legacy by being the best that I can be, by trying to live up to that standard. Now we all have our different styles and we get there through different roads, but the destination point ideally is the same, a quality broadcast and one that's particular to whatever my style is. And Brendan is doing just that in his own style. But I think Brendan's work has been sensational. I think he um, has made as seamless a transition as you could possibly make. And he should be there as long as he wants to be. And I would really only wish that for any broadcaster who follows any of us who have put in our time and hopefully at a reasonably high level any place is that you just shoot for the moon be the best you can be and be yourself fantastic advice and uh before i let you go howie i can't let you go without hitting you with w at least one trivia question uh because i know that's your bread and butter during one of your career highlights the johan santana no hitter mm -hmm. Who was warming up in the bullpen in the ninth inning? I don't think I took one glance at the bullpen in the ninth inning. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I, I probably referenced whoever would have been throwing. This is 2012. I know that um, there was a little incident that, that came out later that um, one of the relievers, Ramon Ramirez, I think it was, actually hurt himself running in from the bullpen to get into the celebration after the no-hitter. That's a so, Mets injury. Uh, I, I don't remember if, would Frankie Rodriguez have been even there in 2012? I don't even remember the timeline of who, who would have been closing then. I know he wouldn't have had a lot of, they weren't a very good team then. So, you know, it's not as though there are a lot of opportunities to, you know, save games. But I have no idea. And what I'd really like to know is if I even mentioned it on the air, because 
so focused on, on Santana. And, and it was also a short top of the ninth inning, thankfully, except for the last at bat. First two guys went out pretty quickly. They did. Um, I think it was Alan Craig and Matt Holliday. And then up came David Fries and with Yadier Molina on deck. I mean, that, um, but no, the short answer is no, I have no idea. The only reason I know it is because the, the broadcast camera gave it like a three second clip. I don't even think Gary mentioned it either. Elvin Ramirez, Mets oh. Oh. How is that name not on the tip of your tongue, Howie? I would not have, if you gave me, let's see, it's eight years going on nine since 2012. You can give me another eight and a half years to come up with the answer to that. I would not have done. I don't even remember Elvin Ramirez. Elvin Ramirez. There you go, kids. Uh, well, Howie, I thank you so much for your time here. For uh, my pleasure here today, uh, I want to quote uh, one of my favorite tweets that I have in my bookmarks: "If the Mets could only play baseball like their announcers called baseball, uh -huh. we'd never lose." Thank you uh -huh. so much for your time, Howie. That's nice, Casey. My pleasure. Thank you. That'll do it for us here on the Hat City Hockey Show. If you like this episode, be sure to click like and subscribe for future content. And don't forget to join us next week for our 2020 finale when we are joined by former broadcaster for the Houston Astros and current voice of the University of Arkansas Razorbacks, Brett Dolan. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm Casey Bryant. Take care.